go ahead. Oh, oh, <laughs> Hello. So, I, I have to introduce myself. I'm Erin Sullivan, and I'm an astrologer, and I almost love doing my talks for EA Zoom. It's my what I consider to be sort of my, you know, just my gift. I love doing it. And so what we're doing today is I'm going to teach more about like composite horoscopes. I have a ter terrific example and um, I'm going to use that. And I have, it, it, you know, this is a, comp a, char um, a PowerPoint that's basically slated for like almost two hours. So I'm going to cut off at the end of my using Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud. And I will leave um, Marie and Pierre Curie to another talk um, going into depth on them because it's a powerful relationship and one that makes people gasp when they see the relationship between the two. Now, what this is, is to describe graphically what a, a meeting what a composite is a composite chart i mean when you're in a relationship it doesn't matter if it's your professor i mean you know any any kind of really strong tight involved relationship will describe itself when you set the composite horoscope and i mean i've been doing astrology for 50 years and you know there was a day when you had to do it by hand and uh uh I, and there's no end to the joy you know when when i was young and learning and still learning today 50 years later but i've learned how to illustrate things through powerpoint which is one of my favorite art forms and so what what the midpoint is is the meeting place between you and say me and so it'd be my chart and your chart combined to create a composite of the two points which literally means not, it means that no matter where I am with you, like you might be in, in France, for example, and I'm in Victoria, British Columbia, or Santa Fe as I am, that composite chart doesn't change. It, it doesn't matter where you are, that is the meeting point of the two psyches and the two souls. And so it is an absolute fixed, like a horoscope, but it's different because you, you don't have to relocate it. You can go anywhere. But your composite horoscope, which will describe in many ways the type of relationship that you actually have. And, oh, I'm going to end the show. I'm going to go next. And so what a, you know, showing you the horoscope wheel and two possible planets, yeah? This would be, say, somebody's sun and somebody's uh, sun. And when you make a composite, it falls right in between. Okay, so that's the actual literal midpoint between the two planets that create the composite chart. Oh, I keep wanting to end the show. I must be having a, some kind of weird breakdown. <laughs> oh, and here's even a better little example that shows you, now that I've shown you the sort of the basics, you see where I've illustrated here is that there's you, and me and us. Let's say that you've got uh, your son and your friend or your composite person's son is uh, 45 degrees apart. Yeah. The meeting point would be, or sorry, if it was a square, let's say you had a square of the sons. Your son was square to your friend's son, your partner. Then the meeting place between your son and your partner or your friends or your teacher's son will fall between. So it will be literally from a square, it goes into a 45 degree angle. If, for example, you have um, planets that fall in a triangulation, then that would mark, obviously, a grand trine. This is what's so interesting, is, is that you have a grand trine, they have a grand trine, and it could turn out that there's actually a grand trine between the two of you. And so we think in terms of um, the closest orb between any relationship of the planets. These days, it's very simple because you just simply set a composite chart. 
and the composite chart is not, um, you know, it's the one that I like to use. And when I was, uh, you know, this is way back, this, I, this diagram, I actually created, okay? I mean, it was, I, I have a photocopies of it, which I've put into my PowerPoint here to illustrate it more clearly what I'm saying about the meeting place. So if you put each degree, and, and what this is, I created, as I said, I made this, I, I had it, you know, I photocopied it and then I cut it and pasted it and made it into a place where my son, which is not my son, and somebody else's son, I put all the planets down one side and all the other person's planet down the other side. And then for each planet, the same planet, I would draw a line say from my son to their son. And where it crosses in the zodiac is exactly in between. So this made it much easier to, to make a composite chart in the old days. Um, so that's what I'm saying is, is if you've got a zero Taurus sun and your friend has a zero Libra sun, then you're going to have a 15 degree of Cancer Capricorn axis, but it would be, if it's even one or two minutes closer, you would decide whether it's Cancer or Capricorn. The computer program would decide if it is, but this is the meeting place at 15 degrees of the Sun and Libra is Cancer because it is the closest. If it were not the closest point, it would meet here in Capricorn, okay? Is that a clear diagram? I mean, Yes, very clear. It was so easy, you know, to do after I was like going mad trying to, you know, calculate composite charts. And in those days, we didn't have such a thing. And so that's what I did. And in order to be able to, you know, find this um, midpoint between the two people, what, what this involves is it's as if the third, the, there's you and your friend or partner and then there's a third entity. And so the composite horoscope is a the relationship. That's why I say you, me, and us. So there's me and, and my other, and then there's what our relationship is. And what the relationship is, is actually, literally, a third entity that has demands and requirements. It can be both a safe container, it can also at times be a threatening container. Maybe the composite horoscope is getting some transits that are really hard. Yeah, like we have them. And that's, the, you know, I'm using an old fashioned word, but hard aspect would be say Saturn conjunct the sun in the composite horoscope. Well, the horse, that, that composite, the relationship will be undergoing some kind of, you know, need for restructuring. And so I can look at the two uh, natal horoscopes and when I do that, I see that it's possible that the, the people themselves, the individuals, are not really having a difficult uh, time by transiting uh, uh, influence in their, in their natal chart. But the relationship is demanding that it gets some attention. It ha Maybe they've not been, you know, really working on the, not that you should be slaving away over a relationship, that's not a good sign. However, um, there are times in really long-term relationships where it goes through real testing periods. There are also times when the relationship is like a safe container. Yeah, it's not, you know, it's a place where one of the people in the relationship might be, in fact, undergoing an extremely difficult time, either a family death or a job loss or something practical, you know, and we go through them. It's, you know, as astrologers, you, you know, you'll, you'll, you should be able to, at some point in your studies, be able to actually identify the person's issue and problem and who is having the problem. So you do her chart, and I'm going to say, I might say two, let's say it's uh, sisters, two sisters, both of their charts. You look at them, and then you look at their composite. What there's a relationship between these two sisters? Well, what if one of their parents has just died? So they would both register this in a different way because we never ever feel anything at all the same as another, which is where a lot of problems arise in relationships, is that we expect often 
and unconsciously, but at the same time, we request it from others that they that they really understand us. And they might not. And it doesn't mean that it's a bad relationship. It just means that it needs some attention and some clarification. And the composite chart will show you how you can do that. So that it, let's say the people are going through a difficult time and they're not, they don't understand each other. You know, I mean, we have these, I have consultations with couples and, you know, and mostly they're really interested in, you know, what are, how do we get on? And, and I say, well, you get on, you know, differently with each other, but the composite chart will show you what your relationship wants from you. And so that's where it gets really interesting. And actually, um, I will say, is, does anybody have a question? I mean, I, I'm going to be really spontaneous with this. So if you've got it so far, we'll move ahead. Because I want to get into Freud and Jung. What a pair. And no questions. Fine. So you get it. All right. <laughs> the Boys Club. Um, you realize, of course, that psychology uh, actually began, and I'll, you'll see some slides I've got. But these are all a part of the, the sort of psychology uh, movement that was going on in the 1800s when Freud and Jung were hanging out and when they were doing their work together and their families were united, um, Jung and Freud, their families met and connected. They were very, very close friends. And I don't know who these other fellows are, but, you know, they're just, <laughs> you just have to laugh really when you think of um, I mean, when I saw this, I went, of course, it's perfect. Yeah, this is the boys' club. And, of course, that was the, the source of all intellectual um, rigor was actually very male-orientated. I mean, when we got get into maybe on the, ne on the next time I do composites, I'll do Marie Curie and, and uh, Pierre Curie because their relationship was alchemical. In fact, I, I um, was just telling Linda before we were uh, on... on uh, on the screen that I did the a composite chart with the Curies for an ESAR conference at a plenary lecture to the whole load after dinner or before I think it's before or after but it doesn't matter I did it and um, <coughs> Rob Hand is just hilarious and he's been a friend for the beginning of time um, as many of us elders are um, he said when I showed the picture uh, of the of Marie and Pierre, yeah, of their chart, and their composite, he gasped aloud. And he went, wow, that is amazing. And then, uh, because it, it is, and you'll see it when I do it next. I'll do that for my next talk for you guys. And then he said, well, your PowerPoints are really terrific. And I said, well, thank you. All right, now here is the theater Dionysus. Now, this is where people would go with something they drank, and I'm sure it wasn't just alcohol, it had to have been the hallucinogenic. Um, there's a lot of thought about the, the drinking parties that would take place with, with Socrates and his, his cronies. And also the Theater Dionysus was a, was a place where Aristotle called it a, an, a catharsis, where you would go and experience something that was really profound and really deep and had some impact on the soul, on the psyche, so that it would create a sense of having been catharted. And that is a very fascinating idea. It goes way back. We're going back, you know, to fifth century Athens and to the time of the intellectual rise. And it was weird that it happened so, so rapidly. It was almost like, you know, Greece that was, the, the you know, Rome, the, you know, the, had been around for um, several hundred years, uh, you know, as, the, as Rome. But Greece somehow just evolved out of the brush. I mean, it, it was absolutely just this wild, isolated, you know, place. And suddenly there are these um, pre-Socratics who were going around, you know, as they said, um, dispensing wisdom for a fee. So I've always sort of thought, you know, astrologers are Socratic, pre-Socratics in that we go around dispensing information for a fee, you know. And so this theater Dionysus, everybody, there were three plays. One was, the first one was, um, was a drama. And the second one was um, a tragedy, you know, the, because the drama, you know, would have been, um, you know, something like Odysseus. 
and another play could be a comedy, which by, would be, you know, The Sisters of. Um, Aristophanes wrote a play about women who decided they'd had it with the boars and the men fighting and not being at home and, you know, being there for dinner and so on. And so they, they had, um, this is actually a true, I mean, this is a comedy. It was a play written about women protesting against the male uh, function uh, as it was being exhibited in wars and so on. And it show, and it has, um, on the, uh, and, and that would be the comedy and that comedy would relieve them from, you know, the uh, uh, the tension of the drama. But then there was a third play, and it was it was um, a play that was called the. And by this time, everybody is completely, absolutely drunk, stoned, completely mad. The whole this whole thing would be full of crazed people, and you know, and the third and the cathartic play is one where you know, really dreadful things take place, but they're, it's, they're called satire plays because they're extremely rude, highly sexual, and they have these men on stage, because all the actors, of course, were male and had to have adult female parts, for example, but they're all prancing around on the stage with these, like, great huge leather phalloi and so on. By this time, people are roaring drunk and completely mad. And so that was the point of the theater, because it involved intense emotion, a horrible truth that leads to a catharsis, the cleansing or getting rid of bad emptions, as it was called. In other words, just bad emotional things, stuff. And then the tragic flaw, which would be the tragedy, is called hamartia. And I write about this in my book on Saturn, because hamartia is a word um, in Greek, that comes out of the original uh, Bible that was written in Greek, the our Western Bible, Christian Bible, and hamartia is has been re translated in the current Bible, the King James Version, for example, as sin. So you know, sin is really the tragic flaw that all heroes have where they blow it somewhere along the line. And so Hamartia is a much more complicated situation where you're, you're, you know, you make a real, you know, the hero makes an error in judgment or a critical mistake that then, you know, blows the whole situation apart. And to see that word and to, to fight, to realize that it actually was literally translated over from just an error in judgment into sin is very strange. Now there's hubris. Okay, well we know hubris now because we're seeing it all the time. Um, you know, hubris is excessive pride, but what comes of excessive pride is really interesting. And this is a very uh, functional male situation in our world today. And this is not all about men. I mean, I like men. I'm not, you know, it's not that. It's that the masculine function has become very, very distorted in the upper echelons of the financial world and the political world. And it's always been that way, actually, really. When I look back to the Trojan War and so on, it's always been the same. But hubris is a situation wherein you become so um, sure of how important you are that it takes on a dangerous aspect. Sound familiar, as I said? And that, but here's the thing, is that hubris is ruled by Zeus, Jupiter, and the result of hubris, ruled by Zeus, is that he takes your wits away, ate in Greek. And that is, sounds to me like what's going on in the world today politically. Yeah, is it? It's full of hubris. CEOs, presidents, etc. You know, you know, leaders of all all the very na various nations in the world have had their wits taken away. So Zeus is very much important right now. He's really busy in the sky uh, still. Now, this I was speaking to Linda just before we started our talk. Is that? Um, see, I'm trying to get rid of the uh, top. Part so I can oh there it I just meant aren't I clever okay so this is where I said the origins like psychology come in there's the tragic 
and comic masks, okay? And the, the tragedians brought us from the shame culture into the guilt culture. And, but what the guilt culture, and this is, this is from classical studies, um, the heroic age was when the gods made you do it. Yeah, and, and Zeus even complains in the Iliad that, you know, if they just stop blaming us, they might, you know, have a bit more responsibility. That's very, uh, you know, very interesting because, of course, the Iliad was written around 800 BC. So the idea of the heroic age is, is that you, you know, you weren't responsible. You could always blame Zeus. Whatever goes on or Venus, Aphrodite, who was, you know, made you have sex with the maid or whatever. And or then we moved into during this period of time of, of the of the plays, okay, of these of the theater Dionysus, which became the guilt culture. Now, what that really means to me is is that you become um, it, it was the interest oh, I've written it here. You you know, we became aware of our responsibility, that we could no longer blame the gods, okay? We had personal consciousness. And that was when Socrates and Aristotle brought it further to bring in a whole new language about the mind and the body and the soul. And that's what attracted me to the, to the classics was it showed me the time in which there was a, soul, a, a major transition in consciousness in humanity where we became, we had volition as opposed to saying, oh, well, you know, you know, um, you know Allah made me do it or, you know, the gods made me do it. And, and this, uh, I, wanna, I really love this. Is this guy here, uh, Jack Furtick, um, a, a lot of you may not know who he is, but um, he is a, a crappy astrologer, but he was also a radical homosexual. Um, and he was part of this bunch of men who dressed up as nuns and rushed about and did things in, in you know, in San Francisco. And did plays, and he was Sister Boom Boom. And I almost died because there's a guy who wrote this uh, a play on um, the back eye, only he puts it into modern language. And Jack Furtick was in the play, and I didn't realize that until um, he had actually, I guess, I, he was, no, he passed away already when I realized that Sister Boom Boom, aka Jack Furtick, the astrologer, um, uh, was uh, part of this historic uh, activity in this play. And so, um, let's see, we've got to find out a way of, oh yes, I love, I can just shift you guys around. Now you're on the side, Peggy and various people. Okay, now, the shadow is a very important part of our, our makeup. And it was... The shadow was not really talked about in Freud's work, although there, he did acknowledge a dark side to the to the psyche. I mean, very much so, obviously. But their um, their relationship, Freud and Jung, who was younger, and you know, I guess it's somehow the time that we were born in. You know, we may have like relationships with people that are very deep. And that, um, and that they, they become so intimate and so interlocked that one or, two, one or both of them lose their identity or, or actually flip into their opposite. In other words, the, the positive side, there's always the underbelly. There's always the shadow. I mean, this picture here of my granddaughter after school with her backpack, and I don't know what on earth she's carrying. She's an artist in Portland now. And um, in her bag, and there she is. And I took this picture against the wall of the school, and um, I just thought, okay, this is not, I mean, this is the shadow of my granddaughter. This is her dark side. And she liked it, and I'm using it too. So it's with permission. And Jung also was very aware of the shadow, and he paid more attention to it as a, an operative force in the way we behave in our lives as we are today. And that it will often arise in moments of extreme um, anger or fear. Yeah? It's usually associated the shadow with anger or fear. This is 
not necessarily associated with moments of joy or ecstasy. And, and so this, this shadow function, which is the, you know, we'll often meet it in ourselves, we will meet it in others. And, you know, and when we see it, it's, we're, we're frightened because, you know, it, it is, we don't know what it is. But what we do know is that it's relative to our sun because the, the, the brighter the sun, you know, literally in the sky, the sharper and clearer the shadow. And also because it's a reflection, it is not actually tangible, okay? So it has a, a behavior. And, you know, I think we all have looked at enough psychological material and thought enough and looked at astrology and the charts and so on. And sometimes people like to name the shadow as the planet Saturn or, or even Pluto as the underworld shadow, the dark side of, the, of, of, of love, for example, can be very Plutonian because of the myth of Persephone and her, her falling in love with him and, and descending into the underworld. And their composite horoscope was been really interesting because I actually don't believe that she was uh, the, the came, like, again, the male classical story of, Perse of Persephone's descent has her having been raped and stolen. Now, yes, there was a, a, a problem that went on where uh, it was decided between the big brothers, Neptune and Poseidon and, and Zeus and, and uh, Hades, who would rule what part of the, the world, okay? So the uh, upper air became and the sky became Zeus and the oceans and the various aspects of Earth's behavior uh, went to Poseidon. And then, you know, poor old Hades got signed to the underworld, and that's what he was doing, hanging out down there, and he must have got very lonely. So they made a deal, the brothers. And Demeter was completely freaking out, which is who was Persephone's mother. Like any, it's sort of like a modern version of this would be that the, there was a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old girl going out on her first date, and she's all dressed up, and her mother's waiting, and they... <laughs> and and up to the front of the house roars a incredible, humongous Harley Davidson with a guy on it, all in black leather with a black sort of Darth Vader uh, uh, heading headdress, headdress um, protection. And it's like, and she's she's going, oh my god, oh my god. And so anyway, so the little girl goes rushing out and you know, throws herself at this uh, you know very sexy kind of image. And I think that's partly what happened with Persephone, is that she was deeply attracted to the, to the mysteries. And in fact, what her mother did in, in, in shadow work, Demeter, she created what's called the Eleusinian Mysteries, which nobody, and classicists are really anal. They look everywhere. And nobody knows where, what the Eleusinian Mysteries are, because know that they exist, there's a name, but that's it. So we don't know what went on ever. And we know what went on with, you know, the Bacchanal, where I showed you the picture of Jack Fertig. The Bacchanalia actually had to do with a bunch of women who would drink all this, this wonderful stuff and go out and start, you know, like being crazy. And uh, they did something called omophagia. They ate animals alive, and it was just really, really intense. And so I kind of think that there was a relationship that was going on there with, with Persephone and Hades that was fated. Because Hades and, and Pluto is associated with fate, and um, in astrology, I mean, we, we do, you know, we see well. Just you can't do much about that, you know. You're just you're going to have to grow and learn from it. And so the the function of the shadow is to come up and grab the sunshine and take it. And this is where I think we get into the psychology of. Um, of Jung and, oops, sorry, sorry, let's go back. Please don't whirl. It's doing it. Okay, well, we'll just have to sit for a sec. Ah, there we go. Jung made this really good, pretty good diagram, I think. Um, although Freud is earlier. Now let's go with Freud. Freud had a good structure, as I say, but it was also male-dominated, penile domination. His greatest theory was the etiology of all neurosis lay in the womb. 
So women, uh, there you are. If it wasn't for us, we would have complete and perfect health, uh, mental health. And so he never treated women, Freud himself. His partner, Fleiss, did, but there's a lot going on there. Both of them had a lot to do with cocaine. They were really, really into it because it made them stay awake a long time and write forever and talk endlessly. And they thought this was a great thing. He tried to turn Jung onto it and he wasn't really that interested in it. Anyway, so Jung created this diagram where there was a personal unconscious, yeah, and then there was the ego, in other words, the I am, because ego is not all about being a show off or being, you know, wearing red and acting, you know, really out. Ego is the Latin word for I am, ego sum, I am. And so our I amness is consciousness, okay? And we are, and so we work on our egos, you know, in order to make them healthy because it's a container. Um, of the self, which is the personal unconscious, okay? So the personal unconscious would be um, uh, stuff that would have, is resting there from say, even the most, the first hours of birth, okay? Because when I do infant charts, I look at them and I realize that their first breath is associated with, you know, uh, what their life is going to be. and. And so our ego is evolved, but it, it also gets shaped by our relationships with others, like the parents and so on. The personal self remains essentially in the core of the deep self unconscious, okay? You know, what, when I say to somebody, you know, your self is trying to tell you that you really need to make a big change in your life, I mean uppercase S-E-L-F, not just self. Yeah, because it's the part of the of the psyche, according to, to Jung, um, that contains everything, including the shadow, the collective unconscious, which is what we're picking up a lot of these days. I mean, I don't know about you, but I I mean, people I talk to, whether it's bank clerk or everyone, is exhausted, and it's as if our collective unconscious is picking up the shadow of the human condition. And it's very hard on our ego because it weakens us, because we get stuck in this place of, of somebody else's life. And that's really negative, okay? So ultimately we need to return to our selfness. The self, and I have diagrams on this in other PowerPoints, but the self pokes holes in the ego so the ego can grow and then become bigger. I mean, the ego should be, by the time we die, as big as the universe. I mean, the I am this, okay? So, and I think that would be an absolutely wonderful idea. So his idea of the of shadow and collective unconscious, animus, the masculine function in the psyche, and the anima, the feminine function in the psyche. And very often, you know, we're attracted to people because why? Because they, we recognize them, right? And they, and if we, you know, as a man, again, I'm being, I'm playing free with the, the sort of classical idea. Animus was considered to be, by Jung, the perfect woman that resides inside the man's psyche. And the anima, sorry, the animus is, is male. Man resides in the woman's psyche. And the anima, is a, is a man's concept or his unconsciousness attracted to a certain kind of female, yeah? So the animus and the anima are the male and the female functions of the unconscious, and they're part of the collective unconscious so that we can project. That word animus is actually used in, uh, as, a, as a word indicating violence. Like if you're angry with someone, you're showing animus. But I've never, I've never seen anima used in another way. So it's very interesting that animus, when you say, I've got great animus for that person, it means you're really angry with them. And so there's, in Jung's idea of the diagram, of this is that there's the external and objective world, and then there's the inner world. Yeah? So we have external and inner and objects and the world. And so the world soul is something that our 
unconscious, our collective unconscious feeds into and also um, takes part in. And, and we also can be introjecting, which is the opposite of projecting, right? You introject the anxiety. I mean, Marie-Louise Van Bon France writes a really good book. I mean, what a, she is a brilliant woman. She was, you know, a sidekick. Um, she writes a book called uh, How to Extricate a Projection of the Shadow. Yeah, and so it's a, it's very, I often read it myself, is it because I think, well, I might as well, oh, okay. Here we are. It's probably just as well because, oh, Aaron, don't do this. <laughs> it's probably just as well because I want to get to their charts. And a, a Jungian quote, there it's whirling, a Jungian quote was something that I think is absolutely amazing. And it actually came, uh, you know, because I go to um, sort of, you know, use um, the internet for imagery. And uh, this diagram came with it. And it shows the, the depth of the unconscious and the, the, the you know, the um, stress and the ego and the battle that's going on because this is actually some kind of monstrous sea creature with its teeth. And it's, you know, it's there under the water in the deep side of the unconscious. And so he says the battle with the sea monster represents... Uh, it's moving on its own. I, I have no control over this, this PowerPoint. Sorry. Anyway, there's Freud and there's Jung. And there they are in the alchemical bath. Yeah, I mean, that's the sweat lodge. And they, they're having their uh, sauna, as good Swiss people do. And, um, and they're, you know, essentially... I saw that just as a really beautiful image for the, the merging of the alchemical bath where the king and the queen unite and they become the hermaphrodite. They meet in, in the middle and they take, uh, they, they lose uh, gender. And which is very important to understand because losing gender um, really has a lot to do with um, losing your ego like losing yourself and that's the whole point of a certain level of relationship is to let go of the self and to become merged with the other and to really experience that and these are very very old alchemical print uh images that talk about this sinking into the bath and becoming one and Jung's concept of synchronicity um i mean this is something that it, i think we all are really familiar with it because we're really psyched toward it and synchronicity is literally the oneness of time yes yeah? sin one chronos 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 time the the fact of synchronicity is that time is all happening at once and that it's always there for us to really uh, revel in, yeah? I mean, I certainly do. I, I see it all the time. And he has a couple of really interesting sort of illustrations while he's seeing a patient. And there's this, be and the patient's talking about a bug. And then suddenly this beetle starts beating on the window outside there, the consulting room. And so, you know, he would <clears throat> pay great attention to that kind of thing. And I certainly do too. And Freud. So we end up with this whole concept of Pluto and immortality. Now, this is where Freud comes in. <clears throat> and that's where I really like this news. I saw how I saw my bookshelf where the, you know, the science. I mean, what I'm trying to move these images, these pictures of you guys. The couch is out, the culture of therapy is everywhere, and science is taking a new look at his theories by Adler's great great grandson. And, uh, and as Adler was a very, very amazing also thinker in the psychological realm. But um, yeah, Sigmund Freud was a, a you know, pretty strong uh, figure, and um, there has been a resurgence of, of 
Jungian ideas at work. And I, I'm perfectly in accord with that. And now we get, because we've just got the uh, sort of 20 minutes, I'm going to show you what happens. Remember when I talked about just, just a few seconds ago about the, um, the Mysterium Conjunctionis, the Conjunctionis between the king and the queen, where they get into the bath and they become one. And so this is the idea of the composite chart, is where <clears throat> we, have, we have sunk into the bath of, of, um, of alchemy and that we have, we, we have become one with the other. You know? And there, that's what the composite chart shows, is how have we become one of the other? Why, how can that even be? Well, I think that composite horoscopes prove that it works. I mean, I think astrology proves everything. You know, I'm, I'm not going to tell my neighbors that necessarily because they think I was a lunatic. Well, I am, but, you know, I'm pretty, <laughs> I have it under control, sort of. And um, so we have these two fellas born, and Jung was born like 21 years after, which is a Saturn square, you know. So they both have, let's just look at their natal charts for a minute here. If I can just de diminish this, how do I do that? Diminish these side things that I can't see. Right. Okay, so here we have Freud and we have Jung. Very different men, very different, uh, slightly different generation, you know, kind of a, it could be a grandfather figure. Um, certainly Jung adored Freud. They met, they got on like mad, they lived, you know, I mean, th th these were the days when it took six months to make a plan to meet up. You know, so they, but the horoscopes are very interesting. Both of them, first of all, have, um, See, I've got to get rid of this one as well. Okay. Um, optimize to stay. No, hide video panel. Right. No, it's not doing it. Um, okay. All right. So we know when he was born. I can see the whole thing now. All right. So here's Freud. Here's Young. And here are they both. But what I'm going to show you here that's really important is the similarities. I wonder if I'm, oh, you see now, I did lose a slide. Okay, here's the other than Freud. And notice that I've illustrated in, to expand that they both have Singleton Mars, except I, I forgot to de delete that, you know, um, uh, um, Jung does not have Mars retrograde. Uh, Freud does, so I forgot to delete that. But he, they both have a singleton Mars, and when Freud was 37, his Mars, because of the progression of the sun, stationed direct. And so that was a very significant time in his life because that's when he began to really seriously get into his writing and his ideas about the unconscious. And he was being, um, you know, noticed by other people in his in his collective, right? So his tribe, and he had Mars retrograde, so he was a revolutionary. And if you read my book on Mars retrograde, or even if just read page the end of the Mars retrograde, and read all the names that blow your mind, um, that people who have Mars retrograde are a revolution waiting to happen, and that's what Freud did. He made a, rev a you know a revolution out of <clears throat> out of out of the mind and the way he looked at the psyche. Then when they got together and met, they both have Mars in the house of tribalism. Mars is in Sagittarius in Jung, so he's a lot more, uh, I, put, I think he, he put his anger, if you will, or his rage. He's got a good Mars-Saturn sex style, and Mars trine Uranus. I mean, you know, he's, he's, he's not a, an angry man, um, but he's a man who is a seeker. Yeah, so he's got Mars and Sagittarius, which is a thinking, thinking, thinking. You know, he worked in the nut house. It was a horrible place for like 10 years, in the, you know, up in the hill in, in above um, Bollingen. And he was very interested in the psyche as a philosophy. Now, if you read any of Freud and you read any of Jung, you will realize that Jung never tells you what to do. Freud does nothing but. It's sort of interesting because he's got Mars in Libra and a Sun-Uranus conjunction in Taurus, and both have Sun-Uranus connected, yeah? 
And so they're both radical revolutionaries. It would be almost inevitable that at some point, as individuals, they might clash because they are original thinkers. And if they feel that their thoughts are not being viewed in a way that are um, easily absorbed and collectively useful, then they're going to have a, dis a split at some point. And I think that the split, when we have, uh, say, look at Jung, we've got him having Saturn in Aquarius, opposite to Uranus, squaring Moon Pluto. Okay, so the big uh, argument happened when there was more. It developed over years. I mean, I've read a lot about them. And I'm just going to come to the to chase with this talk because the basic reason they split up is because there was a dream that Jung had that he had gone down to the basement and then further down, further down, until finally he gets to this part of the basement that is full of skulls. And he realizes that all of humanity is built upon a primal uh, uh, pla plateau, if you will, of the human psyche. Well, that's very Moon Pluto. It's like, I can see everything. Yeah, Moon Pluto. He was also an extremely... Um, uh, it was a very important his family was important to him and um, now he did have a, a, another woman in his life and she was you know they're integrated into the family they had hmm, several children I think about eight kids and Freud who was actually uh, chaste I mean he was married but he did not you know have affairs whereas Jung did have now he was surrounded by women I mean both these men attracted women, but Jung attracted extremely intelligent, liberated women. By the time we got into the, the turn of the century and into the sort of 1920s and so on, we're looking at a time period when women were starting to really arise with their power and with their knowledge. And the, the uh, Bollingen Institute, or, uh, and also the um, uh, Eranos Lectures, which began back with Jung and people like that, uh, they were attended by women from all, basically from you know North America and uh, all over Europe. And they were, they became analysts. They they trained with Jung. Freud didn't do that. He only had men in his life. He actually, they did not have. Uh, he and Fleiss, uh, well, Fleiss had a few women, but his analysts were all men. Freud, so he's very much into the male archetype. You know. And when he was 37, Mars went direct. And I, I don't, I, I only just did this this morning out of, you know, suddenly I went, oh my God, I should, I should know when it went direct. So I have to, to, to run through my uh, computer program and, and figure it out because I don't have a fetish that goes back this far in their ages. So I, I, I calculated it from, you know, from using my uh, software program that when he was 37, that his Mars actually stationed direct. So he was born pretty much with Mars coming to its station, period, because Mars is, um, you know, takes a long time for it to stop and then go retrograde. So he's a revolution waiting to act, and he did it. And with Saturn retrograde, we have Jung, who's pretty conservative, but much more open in his mind. Whereas Freud got locked into, this may well have been the drug, connection I don't know but he lost favor with the uh, the, the psych psychiatrist's um, affiliation uh, for his theories on the sexuality and the origin of psychosis uh, being in the womb which is really weird I mean he's got his moon in Gemini it's you know not in a square Neptune you know which sort of tells me that he's got some kind of strange fantasy going on about women um, but he was a very good family man, and he, you know, had a, a, you know, a decent relationship with his wife. And so, but, you know, they almost killed a, one of the patients. Um, they left town, like they figured that this is really interesting when you think in terms of the drug, the, the use of cocaine, is that um, the theories between Fleiss and, and Freud had to do with that all neurosis, A, began in the womb, hysteria. So that's the, so that men were never neurotic because they don't have wounds, right? So hysteria. But they also felt that um, it wasn't just the wound, but it also was, um, you know, the genitalia 
and the nose for some reason. And I thought, you know, that's really weird because uh, cocaine has a, 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 you know, one of its known side effects is to lose your capacity for sexual activity. I mean, to lose it literally. Um, and, uh, and, and, and you, you put it up your nose. And so I thought, you know, I mean, it's not a, I mean, it was a popular drug in the eighties and it, you know, it goes back, but these guys were, were experimenting, you know, they were drug addicts. Um, they didn't know they were drug addicts, but Freud became a drug addict. When we look at their composite horoscope, let me just go ahead one, one step and another step, and then I'm going to go back. Okay. The composite horoscope shows uh, that they both, that the, the relationship has Sagittarius rising and that Jung's Mars is exactly conjunct the ascendant. So it does suggest that there was something about his group, sorry, Freud's Mars conjoins the ascendant of the composite horoscope. It's a silly thing, I can't, I gotta move it. Conjoins, don't know how to do this. Okay. Okay, <laughs> it's blocking that. Okay, so we got Freud, Mars, drive, desire, passion, energy, ambition, goals, the ability to act out, and it's in his 11th house. Naturally, and this is again another lesson on, on compasses, if a chart has the same aspect in the other person chart as well, the composite chart's gonna have the same one, right? So what we end up here with, um, you know, Freud having Mars in the 11th, and Jung having Mars in the 11th, is that the composite chart has Mars in the 11th, and they had the big separation, um, and a big split, and it was very painful. Yeah, it was a great loss. You know, it was like losing your lover, somebody who was your, you know, your your partner. And the composite chart also shows that Mars is opposite to Pluto. Yeah, exactly. And that, that in itself shows that the relationship was about would have an, an ending, a death. Yeah, Mars um, out of groups and organizations because he was, you know, Freud was kicked out and Jung became very very popular. Not like Freud, but he became popular because he was really, really intelligent and he had, you know, worked hard and arrived to a place where he was really accepted by the collective and people were coming from America all over the place to go into analysis with Jung by the time he had reached his midlife and older. Also, we have the, uh, you know, the, the, the moon Pluto conjunction in Jung and the moon and the sun Pluto conjunction in Freud suggests to me, so, yeah, moon Pluto and sun Pluto Uranus suggests to me that they, that they had formed a kind of alchemical agreement that at some point they would split, but they would take with them the information that the other had given them. Their composite chart has like this, like both of their charts have the inner planets in a collection on the eastern horizon, on the western horizon, on the descendant, because both parties have Sun, Uranus, Venus, Mercury, Sun, Uranus, Mercury, Venus, Pluto. They, all, they have them in the same part of the chart in the seventh house area, seventh, six, okay, descendant. So the, the, the um, composite chart is going to have exactly the same configuration. And that's a, that's a law, that's a rule. That's the way it works with, with the astrology. If you do enough composite charts and look at the, you'll see that there's patterns that repeat themselves. So it seems that, um, that the relationship was like a marriage and it was enmeshed, that they were deeply, emotively connected by the nodal axis which at 21 years is close to opposition because every 19 years the nodes uh, return to their natal position. Both of them have the north node in Aries, south node in Libra. And so we will end up with the composite chart having the north node in Aries and the south node in Libra. Yeah. 
So that shows you that if there's anything repeated in each chart, it will show up in the composite. So that means that those parts are most important. So their cosmic connection is absolutely profound. And they were both devastated by the loss of their, their relationship and friendship. Does anybody have any comments or things they want to say about this? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's very mythological when you think in terms of like the Saturn function, uh, you know, on the nodal axis of the, comp of the composite chart is, is that essentially, um, you know, uh, we've got this, you know, a sort of familiar, fam familial, fraternal, collegial ideal. And then when Saturn eats his son, you know, devours his son, which is his, his Kronos eats his, his son Zeus, um, we end up seeing some kind of relationship in this composite chart that shows that their dependency on each other was quite profound. Now, they both have um, Neptune with Jupiter, sorry, both have Neptune in the same um, kind of realm as in its relationship to the other planets, and Neptune in the composite chart is square to Jupiter. Neptune in is conjunct Jupiter in Freud's chart, and Neptune is, you know, in the opposing zone. To Jupiter, and so they come together, as I showed you in the very beginning, to form a square because one of them is in a conjunction, Neptune Jupiter, and the other is in an opposition, which means that the meeting place between those aspects form a square. So they split for ideological and spiritual reasons, but they also split because of power struggles by and large, ambition, but you know. Uh, Freud, by this time, had pretty much, you know, lost favor, and, and he had a terrible breakdown. Jung suffered terribly from depression, and it was one of the things that he spent a lot of time in bed uh, writing. And he writes to his colleagues, you see, and tells them, I'm, I'm in bed, I can't get out, I'm, uh, and for you know, weeks and weeks at a time. And Freud had never suffered from any of the kind of psychological. He suffered from our agitation and arrested development. And I think that has to do with the composite chart needing to be freed and liberated. Because um, what we have here is Jung's Mars right on the ascendant. And it means that Jung was the one that did the breaking away, even though it was Freud who actively terminated it verbally, you know, in a letter. Aaron, I have a question for you about the Mars-Pluto opposition. In, yes, it, where? In the composite. Yes, okay. So, um, in any kind of Mars-Pluto contact in a composite, you would say that that would be the death of something, I mean, no, I mean, no, no. I, I shouldn't maybe have used that word because I don't see Pluto as being death. Um, I, I do see it as being uh, powerful, overpowering, the most powerful thing. Uh, so are you, you know, concerned that any Pluto contact in the chart might mean that the relationship well, will be uh, yeah, specifically Mars Pluto. I thought you were speaking to um, Mars being a separation from the relationship yes. in death or something. So I was just, I guess, oh, yeah. the death of the, the, the yes, I, yes, you're right. You're, you're. Thank you. Sorry, I, I misinterpreted what you were saying. Their association, eleventh house, their tribalism, eleventh house, and their creativity, their fifth house. They took different paths and it, the plutonian side um i think has a lot to do with with the freudian aspect of the way freud looked at psychology and that and that they split you know, pluto does you know um does rule 
Scorpio, so it's the dispositor of Mars. Mars is the old ruler of Pluto. So we end up with, you know, Pluto wasn't even sighted when these people were born, right? So we end up with a, a, a an uncon deeply unconscious um, battle, I think, that goes on between the lower power, Mars, and the higher power, Pluto, because Pluto doesn't necessarily mean death. It can also mean rebirthing. I mean, not having to die, but just being born again. And, and right. Again. I was wondering about that because I was thinking about a Mars, Pluto, Uranus, actually, conjunction in the first house. It could be a rebirth or a new beginning. Absolutely. Even though Mars is coming into balsamic phase with Pluto. I don't know. I was just thinking about that. Well, this is a pretty close. I mean, you know, you give it another few days and Mars was exactly, well, it's, it's, the, the composite chart is a composite chart. It's not a, a you know, I don't the ephemeris. So yes, I, I would think that would be, that there was just an overwhelming need for the relationship to transform. And in order sometimes for things to transform, they have to change shape. And Hades is a shapeshifter, you know? And, and, and the fact that there, it's so incestuous, you know, Mars... You know, you know, being the ruler of, you know, the old ruler of Scorpio, Pluto dispositing it as the new ruler of Scorpio. You know, there's people think in terms sometimes of exaltations and, you know, some of the older terms. But Mars is definitely a strong planet. Yeah. But I, I and the square of Jupiter to Neptune, that they're, that they're ideals and their, their, you know, their vision, their philosophies were at odds with each other at some point. Now, I wouldn't know when. I mean, I, if I were speaking to them, I would say, you know, you have to watch out that you don't let yourselves get carried away with your, you know, belief systems and your philosophies and let it, you know, um, in your spiritual uh, lives, don't let it interfere with the friendship, which would be very difficult with the Mars opposite Pluto. Very difficult because they're very stubborn people. Thanks. And, And you can see that they loved each other. Look at this, Moon, Venus, Mercury, Sun, all in this, you know, seventh house. There was a great, great love there between the two, and it produced tremendous amounts of work between the two of them. So psychology, you know, today, as we use it, you know, and as astrologers use it, we can use it in a very transcendental way. And I think these, these men really contributed a lot together. There's another question. Um, yes. I'm going to read it. Peggy wrote, since they have the same nodes, could they have been together in a previous lifetime and came together again to follow similar, pa similar paths in this life? Well, that would be what is written. I mean, yeah. I, that's, there's a nodal axis. I always see the nodes are where... Um, they're the intersection of the Earth's orbit around the sun and the moon's orbit around the, the Earth. So what you end up with is, is an area where you can slip in, yeah, in between the, the sort of sun and the moon and, and the Earth. And so I, I, that's my sort of rationalization that it is an incarnational indicator, yeah, the south and north node, not an evolutionary astrology, according to Jeff, the one who began this. Um, Thinking, way of thinking is power of Pluto. I edited that book. I can't believe it. It was so amazing. We were so young. Anyway, um, the evolutionary concept of I incarnating, you have to come in through the mother's body, moon, onto the planet Earth, yeah, which is the moon going around the Earth, through the, the nodal axis, which is constantly moving and we're constantly slip people are slipping in through that axis that's how i would look at the incarnation and i think that young's incarnational points you know with his his axis on the eighth and the second really has a lot to do with his own certain you know that he is very tied into his self-worth and that his self-worth is very much applies to where uh freud had his um his uh nodal axis because it was just a matter of a couple of years before, you know, after it returned, you know, it's full cycle of 19 years. And so I think that they both, I mean, with Freud, he had his North node, South node axis, six and 10. So his ideas of the unconscious, he was the first person to talk about it in that way. 
and the body. These are the two, you know, the like psyche, soul, 12th house, body, sema, 6th house. So he was really into the body, mind theory. Whereas I think Jung was more into uh, asking questions. Like Freud was forever telling you what to do. And Jung was forever asking questions. If you read anything that Jung writes, he never is saying it as an absolute. He always is questioning what's going on. And I think that split them apart. Okay, Erin, that brings us to the end of your meeting. Thank you so much. So interesting, so incredible. Um, and let's get some comments from the audience on, on how they felt about this meeting. Please unmute and let us know. Oh, yeah, thanks. That's great. Oh, look yeah. at This was absolutely fantastic. Thank thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks, Erin. Love to hear you talking. Absolutely fascinating, Erin. No surprise. Thank <laughs> you. Really amazing. I'm really surprised to see that they both had the North Node in Aries and the Mars as a singleton planet. And also like the aspects in the with the, the Mars is yeah, it's it, I'm very surprised to see this whole thing. Thank you so much for this uh, meeting. Well, thank you. It's it really enlightening this this one particular one. When we see Mary Curie and Pierre, you'll you'll be equally astounded. And we'll do that another uh, next time. Good. Thank you, Aaron. You're very welcome. Thank you, Ari.